one of the most profound, one of the theological deepest, one of the most majestic texts of the Bible is the introduction to the Gospel of John. Welcome to another tidbit from the Bible. I'm Dr. Paul Peterson and today we are going to study the prologue to the Gospel of John, the first 14 or the first 18 verses. I will read, I will comment and we will summarize. Let's jump straight into the text and read from this time from New International Version. In the beginning, John says, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. You come to think about the creation account from Genesis 1-1 for many reasons. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning was the Word. And God created through his word. Now we have this word personified, which is actually not completely foreign to the Pentateuch as well. He was God. There is grammatically no way that you can translate this, he was a God, as if the New Testament here says there are more than one God. Let's read on. Through him, in verse 3, all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. So, another theme that reminds us of Genesis creation. Light was the first that was created. But also themes that lead us into the Gospel of John. Life and its victory over death and light and its victory over darkness are important themes in the book. The light shines in the darkness, which is a general statement, of course, but then it becomes specific that darkness has not understood it. It didn't grasp it. Jesus came. He was not understood. And then John moves to the preparation. He has described the identity of the word and now the preparation for the coming of the word as light. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. We know him as John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light, the true light that gives light to every man who is coming into the world. So John the Baptist is preparation. And the theme of believing is also now being mentioned. That becomes an important theme throughout the gospel. He was in the world. And now we are speaking about the light. And though through the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. So twice you have mentioned the negative response to the arrival of the light of Jesus. But then you have twice the positive response. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision, or of a husband's will, or man's will, or the will of the flesh, but born of God. Two questions, issues here. First, we have become accustomed to say that all people are the children of God. That is, of course, true in the sense that God is their creator. He cares for them. But here, the children, those who enter the family of God, are those who believe, and those who don't are not God's children. Here, adoption into the family of God 
depends on or comes through belief in Christ. However, those people who are entering the family of God do not do that because of some inherent power, some merit. They do so because they are born by God's will. It comes to them from outside. And later we will see that this birth is created by the Spirit. Not the Spirit within me, but the Holy Spirit who comes to me from above. So, we have a description of the mission or the identity of the word. We have the preparation through John. We have a description of those who say no and those who say yes to Jesus. And then we turn to a description of the mission of the word. You could say that verse 14 is the climax of the prologue so far. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have then seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. There are so many aspects of this verse that could benefit from an elaboration. First, the word became flesh. That simply means the word became human. It became a human person. It's not that the word came into flesh, though that's often what is implied by the term incarnation, into the flesh. No, the word became a human. And he became a human among other humans. He made his dwelling among us. And then the term dwelling from the Greek no means <coughs> that he pitched his tent among us. He tabernacled among us. And the, the connotation here is to the wilderness wandering where the glory of God entered the temple. Later, Isaiah in chapter 6 saw the glory of God. The Hebrew Kavod, Ezekiel saw the glory of God coming to the new temple that he envisioned. Here it is said, we saw his, or we have seen his glory. And the concept of glory in the Gospel of John may surprise you. As you read through, and come especially to chapter 12, verse 23 to 41, the glory of God is here seen as the glory of his character, as revealed on the cross when Jesus, out of love, died to save you and me. That is where his glory is revealed. We saw that glory. Then, New International Version says, The glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth, the intimate relationship between the word, the Son and the Father is once again emphasized. But sh a short comment on the translation, the one and only. The traditional translation <coughs> would say that the only one born to, the only begotten. That has been proved a long time ago from a grammatical and linguistic perspective not to hold water. You have two options. Either the term is derived from the verb genau, which means to beget or to be born, or it is derived from mono and genus, which means sort, type, generation maybe. So the meaning is this is someone who is one of the kind, one and only, unique. It's not the one, only one born to, which of course is also contradicted by the very fact that in the previous verse, the children of God are born of God with the same verb, genau. So this is, in NIV, a correct translation, 
the one and only monogenes. Later on in the Bible, it is used, for instance, about Isaac in Hebrew 11. And Isaac was the unique son of Abraham, but he was certainly not the only one born to Abraham. Outside the Bible, you find it used once about the Holy Spirit, and the church father, Clement, used it about the fabled phoenix, the bird who was supposed to live 500 years. It was certainly not the only one born to, but it was unique. And so is Jesus. His relationship to the Father is unique. He was God who became a human being to save us. The prologue has not finished yet. There are a few more verses from verse 15, and it begins with a surprise because we are suddenly into historical description, a historical presence. John testifies. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. And here we speak about John the Baptist. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. There is a discussion among scholars how far the words of John here goes. Are all of the verses from 15 to 18 spoken by John? Do, do they summarize his teachings? Let's read on. From the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. This is not to denigrate the law, but to point out that now all law is to be seen through the grace and truth revealed in Jesus Christ. God has revealed himself to us as a person in Jesus Christ, and that turns everything upside down. This is now the way we are to interpret, and that is emphasized. In the last summary, we moving back to the description of the mission of the word. No one has ever seen God, in verse 18, but God the, own, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. The word here, the Son, the one and only, is once again described as God, Hebrew or Greek, Theos. His mission is clear. He is to reveal God to us, and it is through him and through him alone we see God as a person. All our represent representations of God has now to be checked through Jesus Christ. In summary, having seen the references back to creation and the original story, have noted how the major themes of the prologue will be expanded on in the remainder of the gospel. Let me just summarize the main theological points. From eternity, Jesus was one with God. He was the creator of everything. He was God, but he became a human being. We know God as a person in that human being, in Jesus Christ. Our salvation, our eternal life depends on the response in faith to the revelation of God in Jesus. Thank you for listening to this tidbit. You're welcome to come back as we continue our reflection of the themes in the Gospel of John.